Hello everybody and welcome to this A-level chemistry video where we're going to be looking at the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curves, a graph which is, in my opinion, a contender for the most useful graph in all of chemistry. Maxwell-Boltzmann curves are what's known as a distribution curve. So before we look at a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve, let's just have a look at what a distribution curve is. Distribution curves always have the same setup. They always have the thing that you're interested in on the x-axis and then a number of things on the y-axis. Now that's very vague, so let's consider a typical classroom of 16-year-olds. There are going to be, say, 30 people in that class and they will all have a different height. Some of them will be short, and a few more of them will be a bit taller, and then a bit taller, and then a bit taller. And so you can already see that what we've got is, so far, we've got a bar chart where we're plotting the heights of these people. And this is the number of people on the y-axis. And then we keep going. Fewer people are taller, and then fewer still, fewer still, fewer still. And then we've got some really, real, really tall people in this group. And so a distribution curve takes this bar chart and connects them together in one continuous line up through each bar and down the other side. And you can see that once we take away the bars, we still have the same shape that we had when we had all of those bars present. And so a distribution curve then shows the general pattern in heights and how many students in this class have a particular height, with the most probable height of a student in this class being somewhere about here, and you can make some comparisons about how likely it is that a student in that class will have a particular height. Maxwell-Boltzmann curves are quite similar to this, only instead of looking at students we're looking at molecules, and instead of heights we're looking at energy. A Maxwell-Boltzmann curve will typically look something like this. And what you have to imagine is that in order to create this curve, what has been done is a graph has been plotted with the number of molecules in a particular sample, typically we're considering gases, that have got a particular amount of energy. And so if we were to just pick this random amount of energy here, how we would use this curve is we would read up to the line and then we construct a line across to here. And this is the number of molecules with this particular amount of energy that we've arbitrarily chosen to judge. And we can do the same at any position by picking the amount of energy and constructing a line up to the curve and then reading across to the left to the y-axis and again this is the number of molecules that had that much energy and so what this is like this is like a series of lines that have been drawn of a particular height where each line is the number of molecules with a particular energy and what we've done is we've drawn this one continuous blue line to show what the general pattern is for the distribution of energy amongst these molecules. And so that's where the curve has come from. You need to understand the key features of the curve and be able to explain them qualitatively and maybe even draw your own Maxwell-Boltzmann curves when given some axes or given a template of a graph to start with. So if we take a look at some key features, first of all, we need to be aware that this graph begins at the origin. And what that means is that no molecules have got zero energy. You can only get zero energy at zero Kelvin, and that's only theoretical that we can reach it. So in any given sample of gas, the axis needs to begin at zero, zero, and the line will start at the origin. That's the first feature. The next feature is all the way at the other end, this graph is what's called an asymptote. And what that means is that the blue curve for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution will never reach the y-axis. It is theoretically possible that a molecule of gas can have an infinite amount of energy. Clearly we can see from the shape of the curve that it gets less and less likely that molecules will have a huge amount of energy, but theoretically it is possible and so this curve that we draw must never actually reach the y-axis because there is no theoretical upper limit. And then we can use this distribution curve to make some comments by saying that we've got 
fewer molecules with less energy than we have with this intermediate amount of energy, and we've got even fewer molecules with really, really high amount of energy. Then we need to think about where this distribution curve came from. It came from a series of sort of plots of how many molecules have got a particular amount of energy. And as a result of that, the area under the curve is proportional to the number of molecules in our sample. And so what that means is that we can take an arbitrary amount of energy, I'm going to pick here, and I'm going to say that this is the activation energy. Remember that is the minimum energy needed to start a reaction. And so all of these molecules to the right hand side of the activation energy on my x-axis, they have got energy equal to or greater this activation energy. And so if we shade that area in, we can see that this area represents the portion of the total that can react if they collide because they've got energy equal to or greater than the activation energy. These are the ones that can react, the ones that to the left can't react. And then a couple of other features. The peak of the graph, that is the most probable energy. So here is the most probable energy, and it's this amount here. And this is the number of molecules that have got the most probable energy. So that's the peak. And that's the, if you were to take one random gas molecule, that is the most likely energy that it would have. However, because of the shape of the curve, it's not a symmetrical hill, we've got a bit more curve to the right of the peak than we have to the left. And that means that the mean amount of energy is likely to be somewhere around here, to the right of the peak. And so that is the, the mean average energy that the molecules are going to have. And so those are the key features of Maxwell-Boltzmann curves that you need to understand. Catalysts are defined as being something that will increase the rate of a chemical reaction without being used up in the process. And the way that they do this is by decreasing the activation energy, by decreasing that minimum amount of energy that particles need to have in order to be able to react. So if we return to the classic Maxwell distribution curve here and we add an activation energy onto the graph, you can see now that this area to the right of that initial line, those are the number of molecules that have got energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. That's a really important phrase that I'm going to keep coming back to. If we use a catalyst, that activation energy will be smaller. We move it to the left on the distribution curve. And what you can see now is that this additional area to the left of the original area, these molecules now have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy because that activation energy has decreased. And so it's very logical to see that this catalyst has increased the rate of this reaction because now more molecules have got energy greater than or equal to the activation energy because the activation energy has been decreased. And not every catalyst is equally good at catalyzing a reaction. And it follows that the better the catalyst is, the further to the left this activation energy gets decreased. So a better catalyst will decrease the activation energy by a greater amount, meaning an even greater number of molecules have got energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. We know that if we increase the temperature, the rate of a reaction will increase as well. And we can prove why by using the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. If we take our initial blue line here to be a particular gas collection at, say, 20 degrees C, if we increase the temperature, we know that we're giving these particles more energy. And so on average, the particles will have more energy at this higher temperature. And so this has two effects on the curve. First and foremost, the average amount of energy will move to the right hand side because it's increased. However, since the area under the curve is proportional to the number of molecules, and all we've done is increase the temperature, we haven't increased the number of molecules. And so the area under the curve needs to be the same. And so because more of the curve has shifted to the right-hand side, the peak needs to be lower. 
And that's a key feature of questions about Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curves. They sometimes encourage you to draw a second graph on a set of axes for a lower or higher temperature. And so the key feature is at a higher temperature, the average energy increases, but the peak is more squashed and smaller. And so that means that fewer molecules will have the most probable energy, but that most probable energy will be a higher number. If we compare our new curve at the higher temperature, we can see that the activation energy doesn't change because we've raised the temperature, but the area under this red curve has changed to the right-hand side of the activation energy. You can see for my new shading that more molecules have got energy greater than or equal to the activation energy because the curve has moved to the right-hand side. And so that's a logical explanation as to why the rate of reaction has gone up. More molecules have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. Similarly, if we lower the temperature to say 10 degrees C, this means that on average the particles will have less energy, so the peak will be squashed to the left hand side, but because the distribution is more bunched up, more molecules will have that most probable energy, and so they will be a higher peak for this graph. How will this affect the rate of reaction? Well, because the curve is squashed to the left-hand side and the line is lower after the activation energy, this new area under the curve past the activation energy is going to be less than before. Fewer molecules will have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy, and therefore the rate of reaction is going to go down for the lower temperatures. So in general, as you increase the temperature, the area under the curve to the right of the activation energy will increase. So more molecules have energy greater than the activation energy or equal to it. And so the rate of reaction will go up because successful collisions will be more frequent. The final factor we're going to take a look at is the concentration. Now you will know that increasing the concentration of reactants in a particular solution, say, is going to increase the rate of reaction because there are more particles per unit volume and the particles are closer together. And so therefore the collisions are going to be more frequent. Not only that, we can support this using the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curves. If we take our blue line to be a particular concentration, let's call this a low concentration, and then we see that to the right-hand side of the activation energy, we've shaded in the number of molecules with energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. If I raise the concentration, what I'm doing is increasing the number of molecules in this sample. And so since the area under the curve is proportional to the number of molecules in the sample, if I raise the concentration, I'm putting more molecules in, which means the area under my curve must increase, which means my curve is going to end up being taller. Wherever possible, the curve shouldn't change its shape. And so that means that it must peak in the same place. In other words, the most probable energy will be the same as before. And all that we're going to see is we're going to see a slightly taller curve, which should match the same dimensions as the original. But what we can see crucially now, because my curve is in general taller, the area under the curve at and after the activation energy is greater. We can see I've got this newly shaded area. And so we can see that increasing the concentration means that there's now more molecules with energy greater than or equal to the activation energy, which means there is a greater likelihood and a greater frequency of successful collisions. And we can use the exact same axes, the exact same curves, if we're talking about pressure rather than concentration, because the wording is broadly going to be identical. If we're talking about a high pressure versus a lower pressure, we're going to have more particles in the same volume. They're just not going to be dissolved in solution this time. They're just going to be occupying a particular space. And so we can see that a higher pressure, we've got more particles in the same volume. So a greater number of molecules will have energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. So they will react faster than a lower pressure situation. A question that you're sometimes asked to consider is, which has the greatest impact on the rate of a reaction? Increasing the concentration or increasing the temperature? Now, this will depend to an extent, but the answer is typically overwhelmingly increasing the temperature. 
And the reason for this is that if you increase the concentration, say by a factor of two, you will have double the number of molecules in your sample. And as a result of that, you will have double the number of molecules with energy greater than the activation energy. And you can see that's what I've shown in the top Maxwell-Boltzmann curve. The area underneath the second curve that I've drawn is, in theory, double the area underneath the first curve, although it won't be exact. As a consequence of that, the activation energy hasn't changed, so I should have double the area underneath the curve that is after the activation energy. So I've got double the number of molecules with energy equal to or greater than the activation energy. However, if we were to increase the temperature, we would get a doubling effect on the rate of reaction by an increase of about 10 degrees C. This is very much an approximation. It will depend on the type of reaction itself, and it will also depend on whether you're increasing the temperature from 10 degrees C to 20 degrees C, or from 2000 degrees C to 2010 degrees C. It is very situational, but a good rule of thumb is a 10 degrees C increase in temperature will shift the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve such that you will have approximately double the number of molecules with energy greater than the activation energy as shown by the new curve that I've drawn here. We've got double the area underneath the curve equal to or greater than the activation energy. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll be back soon with some exam question walkthroughs about this topic. Until then, take care.